Ralph here once again. It is Sunday, what, 12.43 a.m., December 27th, and unfortunately it is confirmed that SARS-CoV-2, I'll let you read the information right before our eyes, is submicronized. Not just talking microns at the 4 micron to 1 micron level. We're talking a particular size is less than 1 micron. What does that mean? It means that potentially, for example, as we covered last week, that wearing masks may cause greater nasal deposition and greater risk of increased infection if the airflow rate is below 15 liters a minute. I know it sounds complex, but it'll all come to light, especially if you didn't follow last week's uh, video analysis. So here we are. Now, the interesting part about that is this. It not only is, now let's look at the research first. Let's go back real fast. All right. And the research is coming from December 23rd, 2020, Assessment of Air Contamination by SARS-CoV-2 in Hospital Settings, published in the JAMA. And I'll have the links for you as well. But here we go. What this means in particular is that we took two paths. One path we could have chose in strengthening our immune defenses, so on and so forth, greater nutrition, activity, sunlight, so on and so forth, which could have better prepared us, and from a very biased standpoint, potentially for the next pandemic, because pandemics will always be with us. However, what we chose is the path of avoidance. And why that is detrimental in this particular aspect is the following reason. Keep in mind, we're talking particular sizes of less than one micron, and especially between one to four microns, in areas which you would not normally expect. You'd expect to find more in the patient's environment or clinical areas. We don't. They're finding more in the bathrooms and the staff areas. Why is that important? Here we go. All right. Remember last week, we covered this particular research article, the effects of mask wearing on the inability and deposition of airborne SARS-CoV-2 aerosols in the human up airway. All right, let's go back to... Remember this chart? This is nose deposition and micron size right there is less than five microns. What do we have with a lower airflow? Greater nasal deposition. What is the micron size that has been recently ascertained in the recent research from the JAM as well? Less than one micron. Is less than one micron an exception? Or it is more common than particulate sizes of one to four microns? Regardless, even if four microns are less, what's the problem? Nose disposition, when the mask is at 65% and the airflow is reduced down, do you have greater viral deposition inside the nasal membranes of those wearing a mask than those without. When we're below, actually, I would say, let's give them the benefit of doubt, say five microns. All right, let's move forward and we'll find out why it's even more dangerous, and in particular, as follows. Particularly at 15 liters a minute, please follow along here. The nasal retention of one micron to three microns ambient aerosols. Nasal retention, focus on, oh, apologize about that, forgive me. Nasal retention at 1 micron to 3 microns, ambient aerosols even higher by wearing a 65% filtration mask, which remember was a surgical mask, than without a mask at all. To reiterate, 65% filtration mask, higher nasal retention than without a mask at all. This situation is expected to worsen for flow rates of lower than 15 liters a minute or wearing a mask with lower filtration efficiencies. So what we're looking at is one to three microns. And what happened? Greater nasal deposition. And what did we discover? Just this December 23rd, that basically we are looking at sub micron particles, even below the four microns required to make mask wearing run the risk of higher infection rates than not wearing a mask at all because of lower airflow. All right, so let's proceed forward. Another thing we'll look at as well too, we wanna to cover, 
what was back in July. Look at the areas where basically the SARS CoV-2 tends to reside the most. Can be possible that these areas are cleaned more frequently than these areas and that's uh, responsible for the greater deposition? Possible. Now look at this. Look how much of the RNA copies are below one micron in size, submicronized, meaning the pores of a mask are to be poor defense. Hence, the mitigation pathway to increasing immune defense, in my humble opinion, would have been far greater and wiser path than the avoidance, which unfortunately we're in a mask and stay indoors and so on and so forth. It's not going to do much to strengthen the immune system. It may serve a benefit in the beginning of a pandemic to flatten the curve. However, ongoing, I that's that's a strong argument or a difficult argument to make. To proceed, all right, now we're going to go here. And this is what we want to shoot for. This our research we looked at back in July, and this was the aerosol surface distribution, which con which kind of correlates or confirms the information and the research that just came out December 23rd. Positivity rates, the floor, 70%. Positivity rate of a patient's mask, 40%. Pharmacy floor where the patients did not reside, 100%. And this is kind of interesting. Face shields as opposed to face masks. Positivity rates. Something to think about. All right, now to proceed forward to basically to conclude. Now, oh, before I forget, if basically, well, we already have confirmation, we're talking an aerosolized SARS UV dash dash virus. What that also means, too, is the air time. We're not requiring droplets, for example, because a lot of times we want to believe that, you know, in order to maintain the five micron above argument, which require to basically argue for the efficacy of wearing a face mask. If we're below five microns, that efficacy quickly drops and those arguments quickly fall apart. But even worse, if you're pulling people into testing areas, and you have a submicronized virus or something even below four microns, the hang time in the air of the aerosolized virus can be many, many times longer than generally a droplet form. People have to delineate the difference between an aerosolized and an airborne. They could be two different things. You could have an aerosolized, which can be airborne, but very rarely we have air uh, droplets stay airborne for too long a period of time. Aerosolized can stay airborne for a very, very long period of time. So here you are pulling people into these testing facilities. You're pulling them into SARS, see if we do dash clouds, hypothetically. And that needs to really, really be researched or basically investigated as of today. I know I'm just some guy in the dark corners of YouTube that's been following this from the beginning from a data analytic aspect. But lives are on the line. And to do an aerosolized test of SARS-CoV-2 in these testing areas would require a minimal amount of effort and have a great return in helping people in the future. All right, but now let's go to the conclusion of that one particular article. All right, here we go. This is, again, we're going back to the first article reading, which is from Assessment of Air Contamination. So this is when we read the excerpts from this. And here we go. All right. Number one, PPE removal in patient rooms had higher concentrations per titer of SARS-CoV-2 with aerosolized dis size distributions, distributions that showed peaks of particles sized less than, less than one micron. What was the micron size required to make mask potentially more dangerous than no mask at all? They basically postulated three microns. We're talking less than three microns. We're talking less than one micron. To proceed further down the article, I'm just going to read verbatim. The concentration of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in aerosols detected in isolation words. I want to keep on emphasizing that word aerosols because a lot of medical professionals have their head in the sand trying to keep on believing that it's droplets. Now, when you just utilize the word aerosols, Detected in isolation wards and in areas where patients were receiving ventilation was very low. However, at higher concentrations of viral RNA was found in patient toilets. 
public areas, and in some medical staff areas. The findings of high concentrations in staff rooms, meeting, and dining rooms consistent with the possible cross-transmission of COVID-19 among healthcare personnel during breaks. During these periods, face masks are frequently moved in small areas without ventilations. Toilets and staff rooms are often small and poorly ventilated. The presence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in stool samples has been described in several studies. Toilet flushing may lead to the aerosoliz aerosolization of RNA in small non ventilated toilets or bathrooms in an epidemic setting. The public area is often crowded. With both high patient flow and high incidence of COVID-19, these factors have to be considered to control the transmission of COVID-19 between non-masked healthcare personnel in hospitals, especially staff rooms and lockers. Only three studies assessed you would expect by now would have had many more studies to look at basically the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, but to say there's only three, when something has such an incredible global impact, I digress, but you understand. Assess the size of the particles found when searching for SARS-CoV-2. Regarding aerosols of submicrometer size that were observed, submicrometer size that were observed in PPE removal and in patients' rooms, the authors of those studies hypothesized that the resuspension of virus-laden aerosols from the surfaces of PPE worn by medical staff. The submicrometer virus-laden aerosols may originally come from direct deposition of respiratory droplets or airborne SARS-CoV-2 from patient to the PPE. On the other hand, floor deposited SARS-CoV-2, remember we just covered that a few seconds ago, could be the source of the viral and aerosols greater than four microns that when carried across different areas by medical staff. To reiterate, what they're saying the floor, that's correlating with the research that was done back in July. But what the takeaway here is the particulate size, airflow, nose deposition of the virus, SARS-CoV-2, being greater in those wearing a mask than not. I'm not going to add any more to that than is already required. I'll have the links for you to follow on your own so you can get the information as you see here. And you don't have to trust me, but at least validate. In fact, that's a great thing. If you just validate the information and that I'm reading to you and do your own interpretation, that's perfectly fine. Again, I'm not emotionally attached to it, but I am emotionally attached to helping people and I will not not just yield if we're taking the wrong path down the pandemic mitigation pathway and just conform for the sake of convenience. This is, in, a, in my own terms, lunacy. They should be far, far ahead of the curve on this instead of using emotional bias to basically determine what research to read and which ones to not. Journal of the American Medical Association has been doing a great job. CDC has some great information too, but for whatever reason, bureaucracy tends to um, push down a lot of that great influence, a lot of great researchers like this to proceed. UH Manoa researcher examines why people choose to wear face coverings. Now this is an interesting aspect because this article here we're about to cover is on behavioral conditioning. In this study, you examine what motivators behind an individual's choice to wear or not wear a face covering in public. Now keep in mind, their objective here is actually to encourage people to wear a face mask, but in the behavioral conditioning standpoint, and this is worthy of note. This understanding is critical to developing successful messaging strategies to encourage acceptance and use of face coverings to prevent the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Put all the information we just read aside. This is what they discovered. No evidence was found that a perceived susceptibility to becoming ill and a perceived severity of COVID-19 correlated with an increase in the intent to use a face covering in public. Just an intriguing side note to take away, that people that you think are wearing face masks are actually looking at ways to not become ill. In reality, there's other motivators um, that they're recommending. For example, studies suggest that being female perceived importance of others wanting the respondent to wear a face covering, confidence to wear a face covering, and perceived importance a personal face covering used were all factors positively associated with intention to wear a face covering in public. All right, that's not to annoy anybody or use as a point of contention. That's just an interesting aspect as far as wearing a face covering 
for most individuals, they don't understand SARS-CoV-2. Many that, uh, be, I mean, I'm grateful that many that are watching this channel understand what micron size is, or at least have an idea what a micron size is, and a micron being so small that it can easily pass through the pores of many um, protective gear. Uh, I'm grateful for our audience. Albeit small, at least we understand. This gives you an idea here of why a lot of other individuals may wear a face mask may not have much to do with basically disease mitigation as much as wanted to please. Next one. This is a wonderful, wonderful example of how a publisher can really mess up the release of research information by accidentally incorporating publisher bias. This is a beautiful, beautiful example. I right, read this title. COVID immunity lasts up to eight months, new data reveals. COVID immunity lasts up to eight months. What did the research actually say? Quote, that people who have been infected with the COVID-19 virus have immune memory to protect against reinfection for at least eight months. Lasts up to eight months? At least eight months. You see how basically the whole message can be turned around through basically improper utilize the word grammar or wording but no this is actually a good news article people that have been affected they've discovered that the protection lasts at least eight months if you read this depends what you want to take away it's an article written for people that are afraid of COVID and an article that's written for people that um basically looking to become immune to COVID in the future all right and this is what the depth of the article said However, important, let's just go, let me go ahead. However, importantly, all patients continue to have memory B cells that recognize one of the two components of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the spike and nucleocapsid proteins. These virus-specific memory B cells were stably present as far as eight months after the infection. Whoever wrote the title needs to read the research. Of course, all because something said with confidence doesn't mean it's right. And I'm sure many of you already see how this is done in the news cycles. Uh, you know, two million more, you know, predicted mortality, this works, that works, don't do you know, this, that, social responsibility, all because it is said with an air of confidence does not mean it's right. Important when reading the titles of articles too. According to Associate Professor Van Zelm, the results give hope to the efficacy of any vaccine against the virus and also explains why there have been so few examples of genuine reaffection across the millions of those who have tested positive for the virus globally. I know the papers love to report on outliers, but again, few examples, and if it's reporting on an outlier, there's a reason it's an outlier. These results are important because they show definitively that patients infected with the COVID-19 virus do in fact maintain immunity against the virus and the disease. This has been a black cloud hanging over the potential protection that could be provided by any COVID-19 vaccine and gives real hope that once a vaccine or vaccines are developed, they will provide long-term. Again, if you're into vaccines per se, I, my personal preference, if I was forced to take a vaccine, I would probably look at the implications and the uncertainties of the RNA, RNA virus uh, vaccines. Uh, being they're so new and looking at a lot of the weird side effects like uh, people have dermal fillers, you know, autoimmune reactions, so on and so forth. I would personally err on the side of caution, either go a vector or attenuated. Again, that's just my personal opinion if I was forced to choose. All right, to proceed as follows. I think that was the last one on the research. Now we go into the data analytics. And we had some, now remember, when we look at the data analytics, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to find a correlation. And that's the most important thing we're doing. We're not attempting to uh, break in new discoveries and new grounds. We're trying to find out what pandemic mitigation strategies are working and which ones are not. So let's go COVID states first. All right, so let's scroll down to all the information, da da da, pair of plots, correlations. The primary correlation I'm able to find personally, and again, anybody else can dictate it, is basically the correlation between total tests, total test results, and death. Now, the reason it's important to me is because looking at these testing centers and understanding now that COVID or SARS-CoV-2 could be aerosolized, it could be airborne for long periods of time, pulling 
thousands of people on a daily basis into a, a certain choke point, you get the picture. Hypothetically, I would be hard pressed to find either not cross contamination of the testing equipment or a rise of infection of those or that are potentially going through these testing centers. Hypothetically, not to create an undue panic or stress, but again, it's worthy of note and it needs to be researched or investigated. Proceed. This is California's correlation between total test results and basically a death. It's correlation of 0.978. Let's proceed down. All right, this is the ICU rates. This is as of December 26th. Going down, 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 pertinent information. That is total test result increase, positive increase. You can see the correlation there. Positive to mortality. All right, this the red is a mortality. The purple is the positive increase. All right, I'm going to scroll down this information. Da, da, da. Here is the total test results mortality correlation. Again, we almost can draw, if you, many of you remember your math, y equals mx plus b. You could almost postulate an exact slope, as I did here. And I, how many tests have we had so far? Let's see total test results. Looking real fast. Total test, total test, total test. Increase, test antigen, da 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 total test, people viral. I'll well, come back to that in a second. Come on here. All right, but we'll look at this. this. So what we want to do is look right there at the total test results. And we could say once we hit 30 million tests, we're looking at a mortality rate of between 22,879 and 24,000. 471 and that's just to give you a basically a look at now right here it's saying we have 31 million four hundred and forty six thousand tests so let's see if we can run this again so we are going to basically run it at close to 31 million if we get the button here if we don't get the button there we'll come back down let me see one thing real fast 31 million in the tests Looking for the three total test there. So there it is. Yeah, we had 31,446,542 tests. And the current mortality is 23,983. And let's see if this ran yet. Oh, did not run. Let's see. Right, here we go. So let's just say 31,400,000. And would be between 23,947 and 25,417. And we're at 23,983. I didn't do the exact number, but you can see the slope is that predictable. We can determine the mortality by the total number of tests, which is a really weird correlation. But there you are. All right, there we go back down. Let's get to the information. Now what we're going to do here is we are going to look at the top correlating states and see exactly how they're handling it. All right, there's the United States. Look for correlations. What you do, for those not familiar, correlation would be one. Like positive is correlated with positive. Positive is correlated with population. Now, interesting. That wasn't, that's not the way it shows in the rest of the globe. Hospitalized currently, you can see the correlations there. Closer to 0.7 or above, uh, you have a pretty strong correlation or becoming a strong correlation. So let's go down. All right, so I have this the data frame set to where it goes the largest to the highest correlation, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, Oklahoma. I believe we just do the top three, North Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia. And this is how I did it. You can get an idea how I chose or made the graphs. All right, and so our total correlation, North Carolina, total test results, and death. Just food for thought. How, you know, as far as why total test results would end up with having such a high correlation. Now I can expect a positive, uh, for example. But you know, when you have total test results, is even a higher correlation, which is pretty darn close though. Then positives, that's that's unusual. All right, let's scroll down. There's our chart, North Carolina. Let's look at the data, test per one thousand. Again, Oxford University. Look at this. Whoa. Interesting. 
All right. So what Oxford University, which I learned from Oxford, is basically they broke their tests down to 1,000 in the cases per million because that gave the greatest, you know, balance on the graphs. But when I'm looking at this, I mean, I'm looking at it for the first time like you are, and I'm seeing this test per thousand cases per million like that. Yeah, uh, again, it it's it's suspect. All right, North Carolina. All right, this is positive increase to hospitalized currently. You see the chart there. Um, this is your correlation, your line, to your total deaths to total tests. I'm talking total tests. I'm not talking total positives. North Carolina going on to go on, mortality percentage increase, mortality increase going down, more asymptomatic cases, heap map, and there you are in as far as what you look at. Next state which pops up is Virginia. Again, let's look at test per thousand. Uh, positive increase to hospitalized currently. Correlation. Uh, positive increase to death increase. I'm moving, we have a lot of area to cover so I'm moving fast so please forgive me if you lose a little bit of track uh, if there's anything you ever need me to slow down on just let me know uh, percentage uh, mortality percentage it's dropping there's our heat map again the closer to one the greater the correlation and there's that Georgia and so yeah that's it's interesting because every once in a while you see these, these really weird close uh, gambits where it just it's just an amazing correlation between the two. Test per thousand is cases per million. This is the positive increase to hospitalized currently. This is the correlation. Again, I picked the top three. Now this is interesting. This I didn't this I would not have expected. Now this has to be a testing anomaly. Why? In November I've that's that's bizarre. So the purple is a death increase. So this is Georgia. And that's prior to the election. That's just weird. All right, then it bounces out real fast, and then this is the positive increase. That's odd. That would that's worth your investigation as well. Uh, mortality percentage. Yeah, because look at that. It's like that has to be reporting error. Has to be reporting error. Then it just drops. There's our heat map. There we are, right there. And then we have California, because California is in the quarantine lockdown. Da, da, da. This, again, you, there you have that, that pattern right there. California, positive increase, the hospitalized, hospitalized currently. Correlation, uh, again, not as strong as some of the other states, but staying strong, just the same. Uh, positive increase, the death increase. Mortality percentage, dropping down. Remember, that could be more positive asymptomatic cases. And here is our heat map. Again, total test results to do, 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 death, 0.98. I think it's rounded up a little bit. And you look, for example, hospitalized currently to total test results. Does it match? Uh, doesn't correlate. See, that's the weird part. So this part doesn't correlate, which we think it would. Why does this correlate with that? I know it's like beating a dead horse, but I'm going to keep on going over it. It's just an unusual data point that no one's been able to explain yet. I'd be like, I mean, I'd like for someone to explain it, I have, because, but I haven't been able to figure it out. But to proceed us forward, New York, again, interesting data, test per thousand, cases per million. Yes, there's a correlation. Uh, what a weird swing. Uh, another uh, weird you know, crossover there. And then looking at basically positive increase, the death increase. Mortality percentage going up a little bit, which would probably be expected more towards the winter month and lower vitamin D levels, which even with the influenza season does the same thing. People are sheltered inside. They don't get outside. Vitamin D goes down. Their ability to fight other infections and tends to diminish. Plus, the diet tends to become a lot worse when they're indoors as well, too. All right, heat map. All right, their total test results to, 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 to death, 0.93. Not as high as the other states, but however, they'll high just the same. Florida, again, I'm picking up Florida because they're in competition with a lot of the other states, New York and California, as far as being watched as a control. 
If Florida does poorly, then New York and California feel like they're on the right track. If Florida does well, then New York and California with the uh, Machiavellian um, Munchaus and Stockholm combination lockdowns uh, do not look as well, at least to the voters. All right, positive increase, hospitalization currently. Look at that gap. This is Florida, positive increase, the hospitalized currently. Let's look out, for example, that's death increase. Positive increase, the hospitalized currently. See right there, that's, that's New York. Positive increase, the hospitalized currently. That's California. Back down to Florida. Let's look at California stop real fast. Look, you see, that's California. Why? Why the separation of data is so distinct between uh, certain uh, states than others? Why? So here we go. Positive increase, hospitalized currently. Not the same pattern. I mean, there's a pattern, but not correlated as strongly between the two. Correlation, this is the positive increase, the death increase. Mortality percentage, since decline, heat map. All right, let's go to the next one. We are going to go to world data. All right, we are going to go back to the top real fast. Da -da -da. There's your cases per million smooth to new deaths. All of a sudden, looks like something dropped off right there pretty darn fast uh, during the winter time on a global level, which is really weird. Mortality percentages, the positive cases, pretty much flatlined. Forgive me, that was not intended to be a pun. All right, let's see. New case is smooth. New case is smooth per million. We looked at that a second ago. All right, here we are. Now look at this. Here we got new case is smooth per million. You have a rise in Sweden. And I'm going to break this down in a second. We'll look at a different chart and look at the Scandinavian countries. What the heck happened here? You see this? Boom. It just collapsed. Um... Basically, new case. This is breaking down on a smaller scale, December 13th to the 26th. Look at Sweden. Now, obviously, uh, we're looking at South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan have not played the pandemic game at all. Uh, and but, however, though here is Sweden again. Could we use that as a, as a uh, control since they did very little in reference to pandemic mitigation? Uh, and obviously, Great Britain and the United States are doing a ton. So we use that as a control. There is the drop. Uh, they were peaking pretty high at, if you look right there, at deaths per million. And then all of a sudden, they began to plummet pretty significantly. It could be a data reporting issue. Um, if I was being the devil's advocate, new death smooth per million USA, new death smooth per million Sweden. Remember, it's important because we're using Sweden as a control. Uh, Remember reporting anomalies right there can play a role because it, it seems like for three days they don't do anything for like the weekend. Uh, going down, 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 down. All right, let's go back to correlation global. And we're going to run through this real fast as well. What we're attempting to do here with correlation global is trying to find any pandemic measure anywhere that it makes that is making a difference in regard to basically helping offset the damage to the pandemic. Because many, many, I mean, life expectancy, for example, you'd think that was in the beginning. All right, this is as of today. Current case mortality rate due to life expectancy. That, that as you can see, there's no correlation there. Population density, we thought that in the beginning. That was in the beginning. Look at Singapore there. As of today, current case mortality. A lot of areas which had high population densities. Uh, now, there could be a reporting issue, for example. But all of a sudden, boom. No correlation there. All right, let's go over here. Total cases per million. These are the places with the highest case rate per million people. Montiego, Luxembourg, United States, Georgia, Belgium, Slovenia, da 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 da, Bahrain, all the way down the line. And then we go back down. Total deaths per million. Belgium has one of the highest rates out of there. Uh, Slovenia. Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia, Italy, Peru, Spain, da 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 da. There's the United States. And so that's going over the entire world. Location, location, location. New death smooth per million. All right, now we have, we're doing a little bit better than Belgium, Italy, United Kingdom, Portugal, and Poland. So there must be an improvement in the data for the United States of deaths per million. 
And we are going to look at that. Yes, we're at 6.798. So it did improve. Less people are dying per million, which is important. Where last, when we first started this, it was at 3.6. We skyrocketed. Now we're dropping down pretty significantly. And keep in mind, too, now that the vaccine is coming out, it's going to be interesting to track the data to see if it's going to make a difference at all. World mass data. Here we go. Ready? Anytime we talk about face masks, it's such an emotional hot topic. But here we go. All right. We're going to look at the data, 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 data. Any correlations? Do you see anything? Facial coverings. New death smooth. Total dust. This is looking at the entire world. Total dust per million. Total patients per million. Do you see any correlations uh, with face coverings whatsoever? Number 0.7 means you're going to have a solid correlation. A 1 means you have a, a, probably pretty much a causative relationship, unless some other bias uh, in the numbers. And this is from our world and data. This is pandemic measures. Do you see any? No. Again, because what's happening is in a lab, a face mask may be very effective. In a real world setting, for example, putting a face mask on with a, with a big burly beard, seriously? No, we're just fooling ourselves. To proceed forward, all right, these are the countries which are, have a, a level four face mask rule, level three, level two, level one, level zero. Remember, four is required outside the homes, but it's subjective because not all states in the United States do that. Three, share public areas. Two required were specified, one recommended, zero no policy. Again, like Japan has a one. You wouldn't expect that. Um, you know, Malaysia has a two. Often you wouldn't expect that, but that's what they're at. It's only a few groupings at the top, which don't seem to be doing very well, which have fours. All right, here we go. So let's look at the United States. Deaths per million, mass level. Again, we couldn't find a correlation statistically. This is not about using their opinion. This is statistically. If a correlation was above 0 0.7, we'd have something there. Even I'd be happy with a 0.5. At least it's a guess. But uh, but we're not having any solid correlation between face mask levels and any pandemic mitigation having any positive impact in the real world setting. I have to emphasize, real world setting, not a lab. United States. Here we go. Test per thousands, cases per million, so on and so forth. Sweden, zero. No mass guidance. We use Sweden as a control. All right, there we have. We really spiked in the cases, but the death rate began to drop pretty fast. All right, here we go. Test per thousand, cases per million. Colombia, just good for control. A one. Nothing's really changed. Even though they were from before, went down to a one, going to the winter months. All right, here we go. Boom. Columbia, here's a, a test per thousand cases per million. Japan, they actually went all the way up to a three, dropped back down. Remember, this is as of December 26th. And they're back down to a one, that's their deaths per million. Uh, again, a lot of the Asian countries have done an incredible job. Uh, it could be the general health of the population, there could be many, many factors involved. But it seems like, you know, let's put it this way. A vaccine for COVID is not even not even on their radar. There's no need. They're more worried about colds and influenza. And yeah, I want to say that for those countries, yeah, pretty much colds and influenza uh, have a higher concern than maybe COVID, unless it mutates. All right, New Zealand. I know it's not a nice thing. To, I mean, not a popular thing to say, but again, I got to look at the data. Data, data is great when trying to remove the emotional fog. New Zealand, uh, mass level, up and down, deaths per million, that's what it says. Uh, cases per million, tests per thousand, cases per million. I mean, New Zealand's did a wonderful job as well. But the, the way they fight the pandemic is far different than our general perception in the United States. Again, we don't do a lot on the international reporting on the scenes. So we only tend to report things when they... Uh, when they confirm a general opinion. Uh, and I hate to say it, a lot of countries, in fact, most of the world is, um, has a different perspective of this pandemic than we do. All right, Finland, there we are, mass level, mass level, uh, test per thousands, cases per million, strong correlation. 
India, heavy duty population, mass level, hasn't changed, but just to give you an idea, here we are, test for thousands, purple, cases per million. What's going on there? That's interesting. That's much worthy of investigation. Spain, scrolling down. Again, looking for anything that's out there. France, massive one up. I mean, yes, but it's not really, eh. A case per million. Look at that drop. Look at that precipitous drop. Why? Why the drop? Uh, unless maybe the test went down. Yeah, it could be because of the test. Now, if the cases go up because the tests go up, we'll get an idea, maybe more in symptom asymptomatic cases, so on and so forth. United Kingdom, da da da, cases per million, arbitrary. Test per thousand, cases per million, arbitrary. Italy, which I was worried about. Uh, mass level stayed at a three. They didn't want to go to a four. Uh, test per thousand, you see this gap beginning to grow. And the rest is superfluous. All right, COVID states. Here we go. Let's see how Florida is doing. All right, California, Florida, Georgia, New York, South Dakota. That we're looking at. I'm just going to scroll down real fast. I'm going to go past that. All right, this is death increase total. Don't want to pass that. Positives per 100,000. Well, there we are. Florida's up and down. They're right about in the range of California and New York. And they're not doing much of anything. Deaths per 100,000. Bounces all across the board. I really should have took a mean of this because it would have given us better information because it's bouncing all over the place. So we go down, down, down. And positive increases per state. California, which has this, one of the strictest pandemic measures, still in, leading the pack. Again, why, if something's not working, do we keep on trying harder and harder and harder? Well, I'm not the governor. All right, Scandinavia. Here we go. Look at this precipitous drop. Sweden. Boom. USA is beginning to go down too. Denmark going up. Remember when Iceland was a concern? And Iceland just dropped from radar. The ISL is Iceland. New deaths smooth per million. Uh, again, just like our Asian friends, a lot of our Scandinavian countries pretty much are passing by on this one. Uh, new cases moved per million. Look at this. Drop down. Drop. Drop. And purple, I'm looking at Sweden right now. Just plummeted. Uh, and then so on and so forth at the line. And hospital occupancy. The reason for the curfews, i.e. martial law. So it proceed as forward. And this is, gives you an idea uh, of the, this is from uh, opendata.com. Arcgis, I forgot the name of the company, not the company, but the data source there. I believe that is COVID tracking. Let's go. All right, here we go. And this is IC beds to IC beds use estimate. All right, there we are. This gives you a more a clearer site as far as uh, the state overall, as the as opposed to depending on what uh, mouthpiece is on the air at the time. There's that. There's California, for example, in patient beds used by COVID test patients. Uh, da, da, in, bed use, in patient beds used as an estimate, the orange, and the blue totaled in patient beds. All right, so for example, like Florida, we want to use an example, incredible, incredible uh, inpatient bed capacity. But look at the percentage of beds being used by COVID patients. There's pretty low comparatively. All right, now let's go back down here. The red line indicates the average hospital bed occupancy in recent times. I think I, I narrowed it down to about 72%. These blue shows above the average uh, hospital bed occupancy overall. And this is as of December 27th, uh, 2020. So if your state's on there, the orange is the percentage of those beds occupied by COVID patients. All right. Then we go down, 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 down. California, just follow the chart. There's your inpatient beds used uh, by COVID patients. Uh, but however, though, the overall has been pretty much steady. That's our columns. If we want to look at the actual, the actual BDT data frame. All right, and this one, I believe, this data, 
I think it's from health.gov. Yeah, healthdata.gov. All right, here we go. Just want to validate the sources. New York, they were there. And there's your inpatient beds used by COVID patients. It's important to delineate between the two because the way they often, when they do their news conferences and press conferences, it often makes it sound like the, all their beds are filled with COVID patients. Even though the COVID patients can be very, very labor intensive in regard to health and taken care of, they are not as great a percentage as often people perceived if you stop the average individual on the street. They make it sound like they're overflowing with COVID patients when in reality, they do present a healthy portion, but maybe not as a uh, dramatic impact as stated on the media. Florida, inpatient beds went down. This could be due to the fact that less people demand them. Uh, there we are there. And look at the inpatient beds used by COVID patients. So it's really weird. When you look at the data reporting between Florida, New York, and California, even though California and New York have much more stringent uh, pandemic me measures, you often wonder is because maybe Florida is not testing as much or is that or the fact that medical professionals aren't looking for it as in depth. Again, that happened to us a long time ago with whooping cough where they basically every time made you know made the news, uh, it gave the impression that pertussis was on the rise. In reality, when they actually looked at the data, it was actually the fact that it was in the news, it was being looked at more often, and there weren't actually more cases in the environment. It was just basically it was being diagnosed more often because they started looking for it as opposed to not. So you often wonder, again, that's just hypothetical, but still just the same. How can Florida be doing so much better and doing so much less in reference to pandemic mitigation than the other states which are doing everything they possibly can, uh, including turning the population against the leadership, and yet do so much worse than states to just say, hey, we're done. I don't know. That's your call, not mine. But again, what do we cover? We covered the following, basically going back to the beginning. We discovered that, as stated, that the infection, SARS-CoV-2, is on a very small submicronized level, resulting potentially masked with low air filtration or air 15 liters a minute, uh, resulting in a possibly increased nasal deposition, meaning more likely to be infected through the nasal passway, passageway, as opposed to not wearing a mask at all. Actually looks like about double the risk. We looked at basically where COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 tends to reside in its submicronized areas, which are in areas which are not necessarily what one would think. Uh, you would think more in the patient's environment and not the staff areas, or you think more in the clinical area as opposed to the restroom. So, and we found out in those areas too, that basically the micronized levels are the predominant form of the SARS-CoV-2, which is aerosolized. All right, so we discovered that, which led to possibly the postulation, a hypothesis, that these central testing areas with an aerosolized form of SARS-CoV-2 cannot be conducive to mitigating a pandemic. We discovered basically that people that are wearing face masks tend not to wear them because they are worried about disease transmission as much as they are worried about what other people think. Then basically COVID immunity doesn't last up to eight months. It lasts at least eight months. An important distinguishment, distinguishment, that's a new word, distinguishment. Uh, this important area to distinguish because it's very easy that you could have two people report on the exact same thing, read it totally differently, and give it an entirely different impression to the public than what the researchers were intending to basically give as an impression. At least eight months, which is very, very positive news for those who had COVID prior, that they may have immunity way beyond the estimated uh, time normally, which is what they thought was much shorter. And few people are ever having reinfection, and there seems to be some nice B cell memory that is going on in reference to SARS-CoV-2. Again, Ralph signing off. It's been a long night. I hope you find this information of use. I will link all the information you need to follow it on your own. And as always, gratitude and look forward to see you all once again, hopefully in Dice Saturday 
or if you followed me this long, maybe Tuesday. Uh, it depends what we report on this Tuesday. Or I'll sign off. Catch you all in a bit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. See you all later on. Bye.